Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Let's talk about some news. And the first story that I want to get to is this New York Times article with the title, Commando Network Coordinates Flow of Weapons in Ukraine, Officials Say. This is coming from the New York Times via those anonymous sources. And I am going to be pulling various highlights from this New York Times article from the website multipolarista.com, which does a really good job in highlighting many of the uh, important parts of what is a very long article from the New York Times. I will also put a link not only to this article that I'm referencing, but I'll put a link to the archived version of the New York Times article so you can go through it. The basic uh, summary of this article is that the CIA is in Ukraine, physically in Ukraine, along with other NATO members, and they are directing this proxy war against Russia. That is pretty much the essence of this New York Times article. Now, keep in mind, this is the New York Times, so this is pretty much the, uh, the newspaper of the deep state. So the fact that they're putting this out there is with the blessing of the CIA and the Pentagon and the deep state. And the second thing to, uh, to note as I go through this article is that it was the New York Times just two, three weeks ago that pushed out an article from the Pentagon and from the Biden White House, which made the claim that the US military and the Biden White House have no idea how Ukraine is uh, running the war. This was from the New York Times just two, three weeks ago. They ran an article saying that the US military has no control over the operations of the Ukraine military. And if it wasn't for public statements made by Alensky and various other uh, intel that the U.S. military, the Biden White House, get from allies, U.S. allies, then they would have no idea what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. Now you have this report, which is stating that the CIA and various NATO members and the Pentagon are on the ground in Ukraine, in Kiev, and they are stage managing this whole thing from top to bottom. So let me get to the... Uh, to this article from Multipolarista, which really does a good job of summarizing what uh, this New York Times article says. The CIA and special operations forces from NATO members, Britain, France, Canada, and Lithuania are physically in Ukraine, helping direct the proxy war on Russia, according to a report in the New York Times. Lithuania interesting that Lithuania is one of these countries referenced by the New York Times that is physically in Ukraine helping to manage this proxy war against Russia. No wonder Lithuania is uh, so gung-ho about escalating in Kaliningrad. Of course, Canada, France, Britain, Boris Johnson, no surprise there. The Chief of U.S. Army Special Operations Command, Lieutenant General Jonathan P. Braga, boasted of an international partnership with the Special Operations Forces of a multitude of different countries that have absolutely banded together in a much outsized impact to help wage the proxy war on Russia. A much outsized impact. The Times noted that even as the Biden administration has declared it will not deploy American troops to Ukraine. Some CIA personnel have continued to operate in the country secretly, mostly in the capital, Kiev, directing much of the vast amounts of intelligence the U.S. the United States is sharing with Ukrainian forces. The U.S. Army has, and I quote, a coalition planning cell in Germany to coordinate military assistance to Ukrainian commandos and other Ukrainian troops, the newspaper reported. At least 20 countries are part of this U.S.-led cell providing military assistance to Ukraine, 
which was modeled after a structure used in Afghanistan, the newspaper added, and the 20 nation coalition is part of a broader set of operational and intelligence coordination cells, cells run by the Pentagon's European command to speed allied assistance to Ukrainian troops. In a battle in, in the Eastern Donbass region, a group of Ukrainian special operation forces had American flag patches on their gear and were equipped with new portable surface to air missiles as well as Belgian and American assault rifles. Multiple cells all across Europe, specifically in Germany, on the ground assistance in Kiev and American patches on the uniforms of Ukraine military in Donbass. This is the definition of a proxy war. I mean, this is the definition of a proxy war. And it's being waged upon Russia by the United States and the European Union and Canada. Australia, New Zealand, those are the countries that are waging this proxy war against Russia. And yet the, uh, the mainstream media continues to push out this narrative that uh, this uh, small... Um, poor country of Ukraine is standing up against the evil uh, and powerful neighbor, Russia. A powerful neighbor which can somehow control the entire United States from Supreme Court decisions to elections and social media, but is, uh, is getting their butt whipped by the puppet clown actor Alensky in Kiev. That's pretty much the narrative that they want you to believe. This is a proxy war between Russia and about 30 countries in, uh, in Europe, North America, and, uh, and Australia and New Zealand. This is a proxy war, period. And that is what this New York Times article is clearly stating, and they're openly saying it, and they're openly saying it with the permission of the, uh, of the CIA and the New York Times. And this is in direct contradiction to the BS article that the New York Times itself ran just three weeks ago, which said that uh, American um, intel and the US military, the Biden White House, they have no idea what Alensky is doing with regards to the, uh, the military operation in Ukraine. They're clueless, completely clueless, if it wasn't for his for his speeches, we would have no idea what's going on. This was the New York Times that ran this article three weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, that, that that is the big story from uh, from yesterday. So, when people um, sit there and they say, "You know, I can't believe that that Russia is uh, is having such a hard time fighting their poor, weaker." neighbor of Ukraine and Ukraine's fighting all by itself and we've just got to somehow try to support Ukraine. It's complete fiction. Complete fiction. The, uh, the European Union and the United States, they're fighting a war. They are engaged in a war against Russia and they're using the Ukraine military to fight that war and rightly so because the Ukraine military is probably one of, uh, of the best and most capable militaries uh, that the West can throw at Russia. They're eight years uh, entrenched in the region. They're dug in in, uh, in the Donbass and, uh, and they've fought a war with the, uh, and they've been fighting a war with the Donbass militia for uh, eight years. So they understand what, uh, what war is like. And um, they're the best trained, best equipped with 60 billion worth of weapons. God knows how much money they've given to Ukraine and how much of that money is, uh, is weapons. And they've got all the weapons and all the training from US uh, commanders. So they're fighting a war with Russia using the Ukraine military as uh, the foot soldiers to fight that war.
That is what's going on, and that is what the New York Times is admitting. And um, the Ukraine military is probably the best equipped to fight the Russians, and they're still losing, losing in a very, very bad way. And uh, let's let's shift gears now and talk about the G20 summit. Let's talk about the G27 summit because. We are wrapping up the G7 summit, and we are now looking ahead to the G20 summit, and I believe it's taking place in Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. And we've gotten word that, uh, according to the Kremlin, an announcement they made on Monday that Russian President Vladimir Putin will travel to Indonesia for the G20 meeting. It still hasn't been finalized exactly how this meeting is going to take place. If there's going to be, uh, I imagine if Putin is flying to Indonesia, we're going to have um, in-person meetings and an in-person summit. But the Kremlin was a little bit hazy on that. The uh, presidential aide, Yuri Ushakov, who announced Putin's attendance, told reporters that it is still unclear what capacity the Russian leader will participate in. I hope that the pandemic will allow this important forum to be held in person, but I cannot guess, Ushakov says. So I guess you still have the remnants of the pandemic kind of floating around there, which could derail the in-person meetings. Maybe Putin goes to Indonesia and you have smaller, smaller sessions or smaller uh, sideline kind, uh, kind of meetings instead of group, G20 group, conferences let's wait and see but uh the interesting part about this story is not that putin is going to be going to indonesia it is that the g20 countries the the western part of the g20 20 countries will also be attending this meeting this meeting in person including ursula van der Krezy. and ursula van der Krezy is actually coming out with statements saying that she's looking forward to uh, to meeting Putin face to face and giving Putin Putin a piece of her EU mind, <laughs> Ursula van der Krezy told German broadcaster ZDF on Monday that it is also important to tell Putin to tell him to his face what we think of him and what we think of this kind of action. She was referencing the fact that uh, she told broadcaster ZDF that she is going to be going to the G20 in person and she's not going to be boycotting this uh, this group of 20 meeting. The reason that some of the EU countries and the collective West was thinking of boycotting was because of uh, Vladimir Putin. Kalona? And so... Um, so there's turtles in the, uh, right behind me. Many turtles, he said. Cool. So, um, oh yeah, I, could, I can kind of see them over there as well. I'll take you guys in closer in a minute. So uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so she was talking to the broadcaster CDF and um, she was saying that, you know, uh, we were thinking of boycotting this meeting because the G20 was going to actually allow Russia to participate, but now Ursula van der Leyen, she has, uh, she has come out courageously to say that she is going to the G20 and she is going to tell Putin to his face what she thinks of him and what we think of this kind of action. <laughs> I can't wait to see that. I am 100% positive that uh, the media is going to try to stage manage some sort of uh, scene or scenario with Ursula and uh, Michelle kind of kind of giving Putin a piece of their mind while Putin is maybe in another room or is, is kind of talking to Modi and, and G and they're doing real business or something like that. They're going to stage manage something to give the impression that Ursula actually stood up to Putin. But I am 100% convinced that if Putin actually stood in front of Ursula van der Krezy, she would uh, 
she would melt. <laughs> she would melt or something, turn to sand. I don't know. But um, anyway, that was, uh, that was interesting news as well. We also had, uh, since we're talking about, since I mentioned the G7, we had Alensky, of course, appear via Zoom video to the, uh, to the G7 clowns that were sitting around the table. By the way, on the video yesterday with, uh, with regards to the G7, the comments on the video that uh, I posted yesterday, the comments about the G7 and, uh, and the clown table were absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I mean, the comments were so funny. Um, I definitely recommend everyone go to the video from yesterday, read the comments. Wow. Wow, were they funny. Biden, Biden was quiet because he didn't have uh, cue cards. He didn't have the notes for him to speak. That was a great comment. That was a fantastic comment. And uh, <laughs> man, the comments were great. Anyway, um, let's get back on track. So uh, Elensky spoke to the, uh, to the clown show that was taking place in Germany, otherwise known as the, as the G7. And um, Alensky said that, uh, actually he said a lot of things. He said, give me more weapons. Of course, he wants more weapons. But he also said that, uh, he also said that he's not willing to negotiate. That's another thing he said. But he also said that he wants the war to be over by winter. He has put a deadline on the war. And he's saying that if you give me all the weapons that I ask, and I will not negotiate until I get leverage over Russia. So if you do all these things, then I will easily defeat the Russians. I will take back the territory that they've gained. And then I'll sit at the negotiating table. That is pretty much what Elensky said in his uh, Zoom, Zoom Skype WhatsApp <laughs> video call that he made with the G7 clowns. Speaking to G7 leaders, the president uh, of Ukraine reportedly insisted that the war must end by winter and called for tougher sanctions on Moscow. So that was the big news that Alensky wanted to fill in the G7 leaders uh, about, and that is that the war has to end by winter, has to end. Uh, why winter? Well, because as winter approaches, then uh, the Russians get, uh, get more and more leverage, not only uh, on, the, on the battlefield in Ukraine, but they get a lot of leverage with regards to, uh, to Europe and energy and gas and oil. And of course, the winter is, is four or five months away and we're gonna further see the, uh, the economies in Europe deteriorate. And uh, people are gonna start to, to get upset when they don't have heating and food. So Alensky, who has been handed this script, remember the New York Times article, everything is stage managed by the CIA, remember that. Uh, he's given the script of what to say to the G7 leaders, who I'm sure have also been given a script as to what Alensky is going to be telling them, courtesy of the CIA. And uh, the, the, basic, the basic ask is more weapons from the military industrial complex. We need more weapons. We're not gonna negotiate because we can't have this war end because we're all making so much money from this war. When I mean all of us, I mean the military industrial complex and the deep state and all of these people involved. So we're not going to, uh, to work for, for, for some ceasefire, but we gotta, we gotta defeat Russia by winter. That is the, that is the goal. And that is what Alensky has been scripted to say. Speaking to the leaders of Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the U S via video link, Alensky reportedly stated that Ukrainian troops would have a much harder time fighting against Russian forces once the harsh winter conditions take hold, urging the G7 to do their utmost to end the conflict by the end of the year while asking for anti-aircraft defense systems, which he's going to be getting, as well as security guarantees. And uh, the Biden White House also announced uh, more sanctions on Russia, this time targeting the defense industry. And they're going to be sanctioning about something like 500 individuals and entities connected to the Russian defense industry. And these sanctions, according to the Biden White House, are going to, uh, what's the canned line now? I've, I've, I've almost memorized it. They're going to uh, prevent the Russian war machine from continuing to wage its war in Ukraine. 
they are going to degrade the capabilities of the Russian state and of the uh, the Putin government to continue to wage its war on Ukraine. I'm not I'm not reading this, by the way. It's just from memory at this point. And they came out with the same statements that these this new round of sanctions is going to accomplish all of these things. It's not going to accomplish anything, and we all know it. We all know that these sanctions are not going to do a damn thing to prevent the loss of Ukraine and to prevent the collapse of the collective West uh, economies. As a matter of fact, all these sanctions do is speed up that, uh, that collapse, as evidenced by some of the statements coming out of France the other day during this G7 meeting with Macron present at the table of clowns where France is saying, you know what? Um, we're screwed because of the sanctions we've placed on Russia, but maybe, just maybe, if we get oil, sanctioned crude oil from Iran and Venezuela, maybe we can prevent the collapse of uh, the EU, which is going to be coming in the winter, as alluded to by uh, Alensky. Another thing that's going to speed up the, uh, the collapse of the EU economies is the fact that the G7 is actually now going to impose some sort of price cap on Russian oil. But Olaf Scholz made a statement saying that the only way that a price cap is going to work is if we get every country around the world to agree to this price cap. <laughs> so yeah, so the EU is going to go to uh, India and to Modi and they're going to say, look, uh, you guys need to sign up to a price cap on, uh, on Russian oil. And uh, India is going to tell the EU buzz off, <laughs> buzz off with your silliness, with your stupidities. <laughs> Boris Johnson's going to make a trip to, uh, to India and he's going to try to convince um, the Modi government to sign up to this uh, price cap. So the only thing this price cap is going to do is that it's going to get the support of uh, the European Union and of the, uh, the collective West and they're going to sign up to this price cap and it's just going to accelerate their economic collapse. That's all it's going to do, period. But, you know, the G7, this is, uh, this is their way of, of sticking it to Putin by putting price caps on, uh, on oil. And uh, Boris Johnson, for his part, you got to hand it to Boris Johnson. At least he said the quiet part out loud. He said, you know what? Yeah, the UK economy is collapsing and everything is going to hell on the domestic front in the UK. But to everyone watching in the UK, Boris Johnson is, is, is letting you know that your economic collapse is a price worth paying for the freedom in Ukraine. In the UK, the price level for goods other than energy and food has risen by 8% over the past two years. Financial Times writes of soaring prices at a moment of the West's no holds barred push to punish Russia over the Ukraine invasion. Inflation in the country has hit a new 40 year high of 9.1% as of last week, but to nobody's shock or surprise, and in a message that echoes previous statements from Biden, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said while attending the G7 summit in Germany, it's a price, quote, worth paying. In terms of staying the course, imagine if you didn't, the Prime Minister said in comments made to the BBC. He stressed that if Putin should get away with achieving violent acquisition of, of huge chunks of another country, then the lessons for that would be absolutely chilling in all of the countries of the former Soviet Union. And that's when Boris emphasized that even if there's long-term instability in Western and global economies, it's worth it. So, with Boris Johnson's comments, I think it would be a good time now to do a clown world, to do a clown world. And by the way, Boris Johnson is scared silly of a multipolar world. The fact that Iran and Argentina have applied to become members of BRICS scares the crap out of these globalists. That is why Boris Johnson is willing to lay it all on the line. That is why he is willing to destroy the United Kingdom because he is a globalist. And for him, it is globalism that's important. And it is globalism that he is willing to sacrifice the UK for. 
in order to prevent what we're seeing in BRICS and what we're seeing with Argentina and Iran's application in BRICS, which is a fair world order, as Lavrov puts it, or a multipolar world order. That is what Boris Johnson is really fighting for. And uh, when Ukraine was being integrated into NATO, that was fine. The takeover of Ukraine via NATO and via the collective West was perfectly acceptable. But uh, Russia's red lines, China's red lines, those are not acceptable because Boris Johnson is a citizen of the world. He is a globalist, and that is why he is perfectly okay with sacrificing the United Kingdom. Anyway, before we get to the clown world, let me show you all these turtles that are swimming around here. There's a lot of them. Wow. Very cool. All right. We got to see turtles in this video. <laughs> I had no idea there were turtles in this fountain. Nice. And it's a nice fountain, too, by the way. Nice sculpture. All right, let's go walking towards Sindagma, towards the city center, and we'll do a clown world. And since we're talking about G7 leaders, this clown world is courtesy of Mario Draghi, the prime minister of Italy. And this is, this clown world is incredible. <laughs> this is incredible. So Italian prime minister Mario Draghi declared on Monday that European support for Ukraine must continue and that democracy itself would be imperiled if Kiev's forces lose to Russia. Quote, if Ukraine loses, it will be more difficult to maintain that democracy is an effective model of government, Draghi stated during a virtual meeting between Ukrainian President Elensky and the group of seven leaders in Germany. Alensky's speech to these G7 leaders, he really got a lot of stuff uh, stuff going, didn't it? A lot to talk about after Zelensky gave his scripted uh, speech to the puppet G7 leaders. It's all theater, man. It is all theater, and the New York Times is, is just admitting it. Uh, <laughs> it's all theater. Anyway, why is it theater? You have, you have Draghi. This is Draghi. The unelected unelected European Central Bank Goldman Sachs puppet Draghi never won an election in his freaking life never ran for office in his freaking life never voted to anything in his freaking life ever ever I don't think I don't think Draghi was uh, was elected high school vice president <laughs> or anything like that I mean this guy is a banker, Goldman Sachs, bureaucrat, puppet from head to toe. And he's coming out and he is saying, quote, if Ukraine loses, it will be more difficult to maintain that democracy is an effective model of government. What does Draghi know about democracy? I find it so funny when Ursula van der Crazy or Charles Michel or Draghi, unelected, unelected Draghi, he was put literally put in the position of prime minister for Italy. Why the Italians put up with, with this stuff, I, I don't know. I don't know why they accept uh, an unelected guy to basically rule over their country, an unelected banker like Draghi. But anyway, um, he was placed as prime minister in Italy without a vote, without a campaign, nothing. And he's talking about the difficulties to maintain democracy should Russia win in the conflict with Ukraine. <laughs> it's just so crazy. It is clown world. It is clown world. When guys like Taragi are lecturing us about democracy or people like Vander Crazy lecture us about democracy. Oh boy. Anyway, I will leave it there, everybody. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran channel. 
go to the Duran shop, get 10% off, use the code. Good day on all merch. And I am signing out. Also, go to the Duran.locals.com. Take care.